Six hours later, the vault was empty, and the antechamber littered with untold wealth. The dwarves stood in the hole, stretching their weary limbs, watching each other suspiciously to see who among them would show the first signs of fatigue, while all the while trying to conceal their own tiredness. The heaviest object by far was a large golden statue of Grimnir, that Drumnok claimed was life-sized, even though it was twice as big as Godric himself. Much more crudely carved than the other treasures, Felix supposed that the dwarves valued it more for sheer weight rather than craftsmanship. Although Godric had done the majority of the heavy lifting, he strode straight into a corner of the vault and kicked at a pile of refuse, gnawed wood, chewed bone, and droppings. Skaven spore, said Godric. Impossible, said Drumnok, with a glance at the king. It must be something else. Step into the vault and I'll make certain you get a close look, growled Godric with an evil grin. You said that some of these treasures used to reside in the lower vaults, the ones which had been attacked by the Skaven? asked Felix. Yes, Drumnok answered reluctantly. But they were untouched when we beat back the Ratmen. They couldn't have laid a paw on so much as a single gold coin. Even so, when we transferred their contents here for safekeeping, we had each item inspected by a runesmith. There was no trace of Skaven sorcery on any of them. He stepped away from the vault. Even if they were somehow able to bypass the vault's defenses with a spell, why would they take the book? We know that Skaven have no love for gold, but this vault contains quite a few magical trinkets. Why would they settle for cheap parchment when they could have one of those? And how would they escape with their stolen goods? Any Skaven wandering these holes would be cut down by a hundred angry dwarves. Seafaring dwarves, said Godric, spitting on the floor. To a Karak-born dwarf, ocean travel was anathema, and seafaring dwarves were victims of some collective madness. The occupants of Barakvar, wealthy though they were, were still met with scorn in some quarters. Tread carefully, slayer, growled Wolfheim, glaring at the slayer. Godric's face twisted into a snarl. One more word from you, Nori Wolfheim and you'll be picking my axe out of your teeth. His finger stabbing into Wolfheim's chest, he rounded upon King Grundadrak. The ratmen may have your book, but they didn't get past my door. My vault did what it was supposed to do. The king regarded the slayer with outright hatred, and then his eyes narrowed craftily. You're forgetting something, aren't you, Gotrek? We have evidence of your involvement in the theft. He beckoned Drumnok's son forward. Malbak? Your Majesty? Malbak had been enjoying the conflict from the rear, not having offered to help the Reckoners clear the vault. You said you had evidence that Godric was involved, said the king triumphantly. Show it to him. Your Majesty, my word as an engineer. The evidence, Malbak. The triumphant tone of Grundadrak gained a frustrated edge. Very well. Malbak drew an iron chisel from a pouch and handed it to Wolfheim, who handed it to the king. Godrek left this behind after he fled. He beckoned them over to a patch of bare stone at a corner of the vault's door. There, he said accusingly. I believe you'll find those marks match Gotrek's chisel exactly. To Felix, the stone looked like any other stone. No chisel marks were visible. Not for the first time he was envious of the dwarf's keen eyesight. The king and the advisors approached the stone and studied the markings. One moment later, when the king rose, a pulsing purple vein was apparent on his forehead. Do you take me for a fool, Malbak? Malbak paled. Your majesty? 
Even the Umgi can see that these marks are from the Vol's construction, said the king with a dismissive wave at Felix, who could only shrug sheepishly at the others. And in any case, if you've been in possession of Gartrek's chisel all this time, how do you think he used it to gain entry to the vault? He... Malbach glared nervously from the king to Drumnock and back again. He must have stolen it. There's no one else who could have gotten past the vault defenses. Grundadrak shook his head and muttered a curse under his breath. He turned back to Gotrek, his demeanor completely changed. You may not be guilty after all, Troll Slayer, but that doesn't change the fact that the Skaven have my book. So send your armies after them and leave me to find my doom, said Gotrek petulantly. Grundadrak shook his head and then met the eyes of all present. Our armies have tried to dislodge the Skaven and failed. They are too numerous. But a smaller expedition, consisting of no more than a dozen warriors, might escape their notice. Nori Wolfheim will lead just such an expedition, consisting of all who know of its loss, with the exception of my faithful adviser Drumnock. Your Majesty, said Nori Wolfheim, struggling to conceal the shocked expression. Assuming that the Slayer is right and the Skaven has stolen the book, how are we to find it? We have no idea which Skaven have it or where they could have gone. Drumnock coughed and stepped forward. Our scouts know in which direction the Skaven forces went, Surely they will have taken such a prized artifact to the very center of their army. Go where the Skaven are most numerous, and you will find the book. Felix's heart sank as the collected dwarves erupted in a cacophony of objections. The Skaven were present in large enough numbers to sack the lower vaults, and yet a small group of dwarves were supposed to succeed where the army had failed. The king was sending them on a suicide mission. At least Felix got some small satisfaction from watching the smug grin fade from Malbach's face as he realized that Grundadrak had volunteered him along with all the others. You cannot expect, he sputtered to the king. Silence, roared Grundadrak. He waited for the last objection to die in a mutter and then continued. If you succeed... Then the book will be returned with none the wiser. If you fail, then you'll take the secret of its loss with you to your graves. I'm not doing your dirty work, Brenov, said Gotrek. To emphasize the point, he crossed his arms and leaned against the corner of the vault. You will go, said Grundadrak grimly. Your name is the last one inscribed in the book. Bring it back and I'll make certain it's crossed off. Stay here and I'll make sure your doom isn't fit to be sung about in the seediest tavern of Karak Eight Peaks. Godric darkened like a storm. Tell him to do a thing and he was more than likely to do the opposite just to spite you. Felix was genuinely worried that he would draw his axe and hack his way to the sea gates. If there was one thing about Gotrek, it was that he could not be bullied. Once again, it was up to Felix to defuse the situation. I thank you, your majesty, he said, thinking quickly. Slayer and King both blinked, and then turned and stared at him. What are you playing at, manling? asked Gotrek suspiciously. Indeed, said the king, raising an eyebrow. I am merely thanking your majesty for granting Godric the chance of a doom worthy of an epic, he exclaimed. A suicide mission to retrieve a valuable artifact from the clutches of the Skaven? That's the kind of doom troll slayers salivate over. Thankfully, he was able to keep the quaver out of his voice. A suicide mission was all well and good for Godric, but it was far less appealing to him. Godric paused as he considered this. 
Then his face cracked up into a toothy smile, and he clapped Felix on the back. I like the way you think, Man Ling. Yes, said Grundadrak, as Felix did his best to maintain the smile. I have a feeling this Umgi is smarter than he looks. The need for secrecy colored every aspect of their preparation. Supplies could only be procured through Drumnock, and he was so stingy that he treated every request as if Felix had asked for his firstborn. While they waited for rations and packs, and all the other supplies one needed for a journey into hostile territory deep underground, they were confined to their quarters again. Godric threatened to break down the door until the king sent him a cask of bugmans to shut him up. Of course, that would mean he was hung over the morning the expedition departed. Even so, the prospect of a grand doom gave him new energy, and he quickly took the lead. Nori Wolfheim quickly joined the slayer at the head of the column, his reckoner's instinct no doubt compelling him to stay close to the dwarf he tracked across half the continent. Gromnir and Gromnar walked just behind the slayer as if he were their prisoner. If Godric noticed them at all, he didn't give a sign of it. Malbach, furious that he was embarrassed in front of the king, skulked just behind the reckoners, cursing under his breath and bemoaning his fate, while Vabur Nerinson walked nearby, still carrying the dented helmet like a mark of shame. The king had specified that the expedition consist of all those who knew of the book's disappearance. But Drumnock, ever the merchant, decided that that didn't mean others couldn't tag along. Wanting to afford his son the best possible chance of survival, he'd used his considerable influence and wealth to buy the services of one Ulgar Masonhart, a skilled runesmith, and his apprentice, Glorin. Ulgar wore a bearskin cloak and had a long iron shod staff covered in runes. His apprentice's staff was newer, but carried its own set of runes too. Laboring along at the back of the column was Tebur Tanilson, a thunderer who lost half his hearing in an explosion years ago. He was by far the oldest member of the expedition. His beard was patchy with old burn scars, his tank of saltpeter and brimstone, and his fingernails were pitted and blackened by black powder. Although he carried a rifle, it was his pack that got him banished to the rear of the column. It was as black as his fingernails and bulged in strange places. From the way the other dwarves winced whenever he set it down for a rest, Felix guessed that he carried some kind of bomb. On the few occasions when they did get an opportunity to speak, he referred to Felix as Herr Jogger. The final member of the expedition was Martinuk Ironshield a gruff dwarf with a scarred face and ruddy red hair, wielding an axe and a shield with quiet confidence. He wore a set of goggles around his neck, as well as an odd mask made of a dark, rubbery material. It reminded Felix of the cone-shaped mask worn by the doctors in Altdorf. Martinuk smiled grimly when Felix asked him about it. I saw a rat man wear something like this the day my clan was ambushed in the lower reaches. Many of our warriors died tearing at their throats and glowing at their eyes that day, victims to clouds of poison gas, emitting from hollowed-out eggshells that the Skaven threw at us. I tore off one of their masks and wore it during the battle. Doing so saved my life. Later I took the design and improved upon it and crafted this. Vabur Nerinson, walking nearby, barked with laughter. You put your face in there. Might as well kiss a skaven on the lips. You'll be dressing like them next, won't you? Martinuk shrugged, untroubled by the bigger dwarf's jive. Lungs as big as yours can hold a lot of gas, Nerinson. When the time comes, you'll beg me let you wear it. Not likely, said Vabur. He swung his mole in a casual arc and shattered a lump of stone the size of his head that occupied the path in front of him. They'd have to get past my hammer first. So you say, said Martinuk, nodding his head. 
Before spending half his life in the company of a dwarf, Felix had never quite become used to traveling underground. Although dwarf-built tunnels were wide and well-constructed, often they weren't especially tall, forcing him to duck his head in many places. Without the sun, it was impossible to tell time, and he felt they could have been trudging for hours or even days by now. The dwarves seemed to possess a sixth sense, which told them when to stop for lunch and when to break camp and for that he was thankful. Night fell whenever they hooded their lanterns, which, in turn, plunged them into pitch darkness. Though the areas close to Barakvar were safe and well-maintained, as they proceeded further into the depths, signs of prosperity began to dwindle. The dwarves were sallow-cheeked with shorter, scraggly beards, and their clothing was in bad need of repair. Some were prospectors, combing over already heavily mined veins of minerals in the hopes of finding a few nuggets that the original owners had missed, while others were hermits who cared little for social comfort and had chosen a life away from the hold. Still others were simply mad. They encountered the first threat in an ancient tunnel that ran close to a massive underground wall that kept the sea outside of the bay. The rocks were slick with moisture, and a small stream carved its way down the center of the passage they followed. Even dwarf masonry did not last forever, and they had just left behind a small crew of stonemasons who were patching a hole when a huge spider leapt out of the darkness at Felix. All eight legs extended as it flashed through the air towards him, and it was only brought down at the last moment by Vabur's mole. Another blow crushed it into pulp. Thank you, Herr Dwarf, said Felix, white-faced. I was worried about the stonemasons, said Vabur with a shrug. He scraped spider innards off his mole with the bottom of his boot, slung the weapon over the shoulder, and continued on down the corridor. A few moments later, Felix quickly joined him. When they entered the Skaven Warren, Felix longed for the comforts they'd left behind in the dwarf tunnels. Most passageways twisted oddly as if the skaven had merely dug where it was easiest to dig. The walls were crudely carved rock. Felix had heard stories that the skaven often made slaves dig with bare paws, and looking at the way the stone was furrowed, he believed that was true. It was easy to catch clothing on rocky outcroppings, or even cut your hand on a sharp piece of stone. Sometimes the tunnels became so narrow that he had to turn sideways and shuffle through an opening with a cheek pressed against a rock. He had nightmares of getting stuck and trapped beneath tons of rock and ore while he starved. Despite being heavier set, the dwarves seemed to have no problem navigating the maze of tunnels. Even Vabur Nerinson, whose shoulder width must have been twice as wide as Felix's, somehow managed to squeeze through the openings which were sized for Skaven. They began to encounter a few Skaven patrols, which they quickly dispatched. Despite that, there was no sign of their massive army that had attacked the barrack. It looked to Felix like they'd gotten lost or cut off from the main force when the Skaven retreated. They'd slept three times, although whether that meant that three days had passed was anybody's guess. And then Felix began to hear the roar of distant water. The crude Skaven tunnels soon opened up into a set of caverns, Torchlight glimmered off an underground river that churned and spat foam into wet walls. The walls here were plain bedrock shot through with veins of granite, like glittering white lightning bolts flashing among rolling thunderclouds. A wide ledge ran along the river's edge, for a merit emerged from a rounded tunnel that might once have been a lava tube, to where it disappeared underneath a shelf of rock. As far as Felix could tell, they had two choices continue through the caverns and see if they opened into a scaven tunnel, or try to follow the ledge upriver, through the lava tube, towards the unknown. Wolfheim, marching ahead of the group to avoid having the night vision spoiled by the lanterns, raised a hand to stop them, and then advanced to a spot at the edge of the river and knelt. Skaven spore, he said, lifting a bowl of dirt to his nose. He dropped it in disgust, and then wiped his hand on his armor. They've been here recently. They could be the ones we seek. Or they might simply be scouts for the Skaven force that attacked the vaults. He kicked at a pile of refuse nearby and then looked around. Be alert, 
These tunnels are unknown to us. The Skaven could be anywhere. Unknown? asked Gotrek, looking up at the ceiling. How can they be unknown? There are dwarf constructions here. Although Felix peered through the gloom, he could see nothing but a jagged rock the river had carved out of the bedrock. You have sharp eyes, Slayer, said Vabur Nerinsen gruffly. He walked over to the tunnel wall and ran his fingers across the wall. The river made this tunnel, but dwarves worked it. The smooth patch of stone Godric had spotted was a reinforcing column, so cunningly crafted that Felix would have never seen it had Vabur not mentioned it. Could this be a forgotten part of Baragvar? he asked. No, said Malbak, adjusting his belt buckle around his belly. The tunnels under the barrack have to be carefully planned and constructed in order to keep out the sea. Besides, we're days away from the hold. It is old, said Vabur. He stepped away, his gaze following the column up to the ceiling. Felix gulped. If a dwarf said that something was old, he might very well mean it was from an era before Sigmar united the tribes of man. To a race with a lifespan several times that of the oldest man, old really meant ancient. It is Karaktam, said Martinuk quietly. The name hung in the air as the mercenary eyed the other dwarves meaningfully. Felix felt the temperature drop two degrees. Karaktam? He struggled to remember the geography. Baragvar was far from the mountains in which the dwarves typically built their holds. Surrounded by the border princes, the closest thing to a mountain range nearby was the Varenka Hills, if they could even be called that. A goblin could spit over them on a windy day. It would be a poor location for a dwarf hold. What is Karaktam? he asked. A story, said Wolfheim scornfully. A fable. There is some truth in those old stories said Ulgar. The runesmith's voice was as deep and gravelly as the sound of two rocks grinding together beneath the earth. He tapped his rune-covered staff against the ground, and it began to glow a violet color that illuminated the ancient masonry. He reached out and touched the worked stone reverently, and then quickly drew away. Karagdron, he said, turning to Felix. The volcano your race calls Thunder was once mined by a clan of dwarves who used its fires to craft its finest weapons. For many generations the forges churned until one day the mountain erupted. Racing to outrun the lava flows, the survivors fled east towards the sea. Legend has it that they stopped in the Varenka Hills when their king came upon a boulder that was struck through and through with gold. He proclaimed it a miracle. Unfortunately, the boulder had been brought there by fields of ice, which had long ago retreated, and the surrounding region was so poor in metals that the newly founded hold was unable to support itself. In order to survive, they redoubled their efforts to become the best weaponsmiths in the world. And they succeeded. Their weapons were without peer. It was said that the king wielding a weapon from Karaktam could not be defeated in battle. Many of the weapons in your race's legends were forged at Karaktam. If this was such an important hold, why is it now forgotten? asked Felix. The War of Vengeance, said Godric with a sneer. The hold couldn't survive without a constant supply of new metal, Wilfheim explained. But with our forces committed against the pointy years, there was no more metal to spare. Felix found it ironic that a hold famous for crafting weapons would be a casualty of war. But what Wolfheim said made sense. A rune blade might be invaluable to a king, 
but a thousand iron axes would be a much greater value to an army. They say some of the best weapons ever made by a dwarf still lie in the vaults of Karaktam, said Malbach, striding back towards the gear as if some of those weapons were rusting into oblivion with each passing second. The contents of even one of those vaults would be enough to make us as rich as King Grundadrak. Be mindful of why we came down here, said Wilfame dangerously. It's the book of grudges we seek, not personal gain. He turned to Gromnir and Gromnar, the twin reckoners. Scout out the passage ahead, for all this talk of ancient riches, don't forget the skaven now infest these tunnels. The two saluted in unison, then turned and clumped off into the darkness. Felix shook his head. The heavy plate that they wore made them the worst scouts in the history of the profession. But maybe that was Wolfheim's plan. Those two could trigger any Skaven trap long before the expedition's more vulnerable members got close, such as Malbach. The port the engineer spoke to Ulgar's apprentice in hushed but urgent tones. Glorin wielded a rune-covered staff, which, like his master, he had caused to glow violet. Malbach was using its light to struggle into his pack. Felix neither liked nor trusted the engineer. It was obvious that he thought Godric was long dead, and thus a convenient scapegoat for a break-in he couldn't explain. When Godric had actually showed up, instead of admitting the mistake, he tried to cover it up with a hastily constructed excuse. Felix resolved that he would keep an eye on Malbach for the rest of the mission.